Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Blender Report, where news meets rational thinking. I'm your host, Jonathan Harvey. This is your co-host, Liam DeBoer. Liam, what are we talking about today? We are going to be chatting about a government-funded report labeling Catholics and feminists as far-right hate groups, a Canadian border agent whistleblower warning that the government has become compromised by international criminal organizations, liberals planning to redistribute to immigrants from cities to rural Canada, Feds urging businesses to prepare for another pandemic. A 15-year-old boy is the first to be charged for rioting in the UK. And the CBC doling out over $18 million in bonuses despite eliminating hundreds of jobs. However, if before we get into things, you wouldn't mind subscribing to our YouTube channel and tossing a thumbs up on this video as it helps this podcast grow, that would be greatly appreciated. All right, let's get into it. All right, first off, we've got a government-funded anti-hate report labeling Catholics and feminists as far-right hate groups. The Liberal government-funded Canadian Anti-Hate Network has controversially labeled Canadian pro-life, feminist, and civil liberties organizations as far-right or hate groups, alongside recognized terrorist entities. The report, quote, 40 Ways to Fight the Far-Right, is intended to mobilize far-left activists against these groups, which CAHN identifies as threats. Organizations named in the report claim that CAHN's accusations are baseless and misleading while using tactics that include doxing and targeting opponents' livelihoods. Some groups are considering legal action against CAHN, which has received over $900,000 in federal funding since 2020. Critics argue that CAHN's report, which groups feminist and Christian organizations with neo-Nazi entities, lacks transparency in its methodology and unfairly brands dissenting opinions as hate. They also warn that CAHN's recommended tactics, such as doxing, could lead to harmful consequences. So, is this yet another instance of Orwellian doublespeak where anti-hate groups are the largest purveyors of hatred themselves? It certainly seems that way, but... For starters, C-A-H-N is the worst acronym to keep saying over and over again. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Switch it up. You guys got to make it easy. Um, look, you've, you've touched on this a bunch of times, and I'm kind of on that same page now. And <clears throat> Marxists and communists label ideologies, movements, or groups they oppose as far right or fascist. Um, obviously, the tactic is rooted in their broader ideological framework, um, which divides political and social forces into those that support their cause and those that don't. So that's, that's what this is. And, you know, in Marxist theory, anything that upholds capitalism and traditional social structures or resists revolutionary change is often categorized as far right. So I'm of the opinion that Catholics and feminists were merely the next targets in line for these whack jobs. Like you said, that being said, everybody should be concerned because these people are a funded extension of the government. So one thing that I've been thinking about a lot in regards to this kind of stuff is how labeling political opponents as, say, extremists is very dangerous. And it's something that gets under my skin a lot because I I recognize what these people are, but then I also have a personal negative reaction to weaponizing labels against people as well. Because for me, especially when I look at communists as almost worse than Nazis, as far as intent, I don't think they're any different They both are totalitarian ideologies and seek to enslave humanity. The difference between them is the effectiveness at which they can do it because fascists are very brash. They're your typical bully types. They're in your face. And so they're easy to spot. Right. But communists. Wolf in sheep's clothing. Dude, they are professionals in deception and manipulation. Yeah, yeah, I know. And and they also do everything, you know, from Nazi perspective, they do everything through the lens of strength and, and that kind of thing. So they are in your face. They're brazen about it. But communists are like, oh, we're compassionate. We just want everybody to be equal. But then you look at what happened in the 20th century. They killed over 100 million people. Like yeah. The highest estimates you can go up to are around 250, 250 million. Yeah, yeah. But then you go up to people within, say, education or that have graduated from Canadian or Western public schools, and you ask them about the history of communism, most of them have no idea. A lot of people probably wouldn't even really be able to describe it very well to you. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. They're both, they're both horrifying things. I think where you lose people sometimes is that you look at, you look at the Holocaust and it's an isolated incident over a short period of time by comparison to the 20th century, whereas communism was like this dark cloud that just continued 
and continue to take lives and take lives. But it's almost like because in a sense, it was sort of the status quo. I know that sounds crazy, but because it was that it doesn't wear the same label. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It seems like it wasn't as bad, even though by the numbers, it's significantly worse. It's just not it's just doesn't wear the same branding. That's all. Well, and the thing is, is that <laughs> the more and more that I dive deep into history and stuff, the more apparent it comes that the West was infiltrated by the Soviet Union. And this is something that Yuri Bezmianov yeah. uh, highlighted very well, that it was ideological subversion. So their main tactic was to put people into our systems, our institutions in order to subvert them and pump Marxist Leninist ideals through our own institutions. They were playing a generational warfare game of ideas. They're winning right now. And so it's crazy. Why do you think that? So you put these two things together, right? Okay. The communists were putting ideological proponents or ideological supporters into our education systems. Our education systems don't teach you about the ills of communism. What they do is just indoctrinate the kids to think that way, because it's funny that every young, every young adult, let's say, goes through this ideological phase of socialism. And then often what they do is they wake up and go, this is not how it's going to work in the real world. But you go through that phase and it's like, how do you get there? Mm -hmm. Because if you train people from a young age to think capitalism, entrepreneurship, go make your money, treat everybody well and do what you can for others. But that is the strategy. They wouldn't have that. They wouldn't go through that phase. It's funny because I never thought about that. To me, it was always a throwaway comment. Oh, that's just what college kids do. But it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a result of, of indoctrination. This is what they're taught. So this is what they do. You know what I mean? So if you, if you changed it from high school through college to think more entrepreneurially or, or capitalistically or whatever it is, just anything that's not that, that I think is what you would see more often, which, which at the end of the day, if you have to pick between the two, it really is the better option. And so you look at, what happened in these institutions and then you you mirror them back to what happened in these communist regimes and you can see exactly what happened in history happening now again where anybody who goes against the socialist uh, revolution which you're seeing now is being labeled far right or fascist in this and it doesn't take you much to get considered that anymore. Hell, there was the, you know, the feminists status. are far right. Yeah. That says everything you need to see. They're now losing the oppression Olympics. They were, they had a gold medal at one point. Now they're not even in the race. And actually, so th this is what's interesting is it's a communist tactic to use each oppressed group against or whoever they label oppressed against the last, right? So feminists were once the revolutionary class. They were pushing along this socialist stuff. And then they overthrew, say, the men, quote unquote. And then you now look at them now being the oppressor class of transgenders. Yes. And so this is this actually goes to Trotsky's idea. Now, not the cultural stuff, but Trotsky thought that the revolution, who was one of the founders of the Bolsheviks, and uh, I'll actually get into him in a second, but he thought that every group needed to overthrow the last, that there needed to be a permanent revolution because the status quo is what oppresses people. So you need to overthrow the status quo, but then all you're doing there is re-establishing a new status quo, which needs to be overthrown. So it's like socialism is constant revolution. Which is weird to me because you'd think what you want to do is you want to you want to build a bigger group. So if you get the feminists, okay, now you got that group. And then you have, say you have like the BLM, you have the feminists, you have the LGBT. Well, now your squad's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now you have more power. So it's weird to me that they continually ostracize the person at the back of the bus and just kind of replace them. It, you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of a weird tactic because there is more power in numbers, right? Well, when you think about what... Marx said in the Communist Manifesto, the aim is, quote, the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. So the idea is just destruction. It's just warfare. It's, it's just, just, just warfare. Yeah, that's it's wild. just it's yeah. just I hate And This is actually something I was I was realizing as well is this is why it's really hard to get the say leftists today to feel any sort of emotion towards the way that the world is shifting because so you and I, when we see our institutions crumble or the economic opportunities start disappearing There's within our Canada country, right it's so fucked. We go, oh my God, this is terrible. What's happening to our country? But they didn't appreciate those things in the first place. So why would they recognize the effects of their policies as negative when their whole idea is that 
capitalism in and of itself is oppressive. Well, this is the, I went back to this last time when you and I were talking about being woke and I'm like, you never see anybody who's good looking in good shape and takes care of themselves and is a high performer in that space. It's for losers. That's kind of what it is. And that's kind of what I'm getting with a lot of this. It's like, none of these people are high performers. None of these people take responsibility for their lives. None of these people are willing to be excellent every single day. That's not what they are. They're victim. They're victims. That's what it is. They live in a victim mindset. And this is, and instead of quote unquote, pulling up their socks, they want everybody to have to come down to their level. Mm -hmm. And then, then it's, it's kind of a weird, it's almost like, um, it's almost like they want to get back at everybody because they lack the ambition to do anything with their life. It is. It's like, okay, I, I don't feel like I can fly. So my whole goal is to tear down anybody who can no one gets and tear wings. their wings off. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so to look at how pervasive this will become. So again, Anybody who was opposed to the Soviet revolution, the socialist revolution in Russia, was immediately labeled either a counter-revolutionary, a far-right agent, a traitor, or um, also, uh, or fascists. And so one thing that Trotsky said in 1924 was, the party is always right, and one cannot be right against the party. On this, Stalin agreed with his rival, quote, an enemy of the people, he once said, is not only one who does, uh, does sabotage, but one who doubts the rightness of the party line. And there are a lot of them and we must liquidate them. It was not only impermissible to be a critic, but one could not even be an agnostic, let alone a skeptic. The freedom of speech and expression that had long been a promise of socialism had given way to a system where even freedom of thought was intolerable in grounds for execution. And so they employed the secret police, and this is kind of something like the thought police, so to say, and this is what you're seeing with these hate groups. And so this is a quote from one of the head of the NKVD, which was the organization, the secret police in Soviet Russia. He said, there will be some innocent victims in the fight against fascist agents. We are launching a major attack on the enemy. Let there be no resentment if we bump someone with an elbow. Better that 10 innocent people should suffer than one spy get away. When you chop wood, chips fly. And so this is like a complete inversion of, and, and we're seeing this, right? Whether it be through the pandemic or any of this kind of stuff where as long as it's done in the name of collective safety or collectivism or protecting the common good or whatever, if individuals get tossed into a grinder in that process, so be it. It's kind of weird, right? Because the opposition doesn't feel that way. Like they'd rather not lose one and let other people get away. Not one innocent. You know what I mean? And that's like kind of the issue with the death penalty for me is not one innocent. Whereas they don't see it that way. Like their cause is so much more significant. But it, it is interesting. Like it is interesting how they've been able to convince so many people that their cause is so worthy that people themselves don't matter. It's really interesting because it's not, it's not really like, I guess, like you said, it's because that's the collective, whereas the other side of the individual, so that can't even exist. So it's just, it's just kind of like, it's a weapon. It's a weapon that the right side doesn't have because it's counterintuitive to what it stands for. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Do you think that people in general, like say the common layman, just the average person on the street, do you think that they are, I don't want to say they're supportive of these people, but they're quiet about what these people are doing because they support it or because they're terrified of fear of ostracization. That's I what you learned so. through the pandemic. hundred percent. People don't speak out because they agree with them. And here's why I would say that because if you agree with them, well, then you get praised for speaking out. Whereas if you agree with the way we see the things you get ostracized for speaking out. So people don't support them because all the people that are supporting them are screaming at the top of their lungs because they're being rewarded with government funding, right? right. So it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with fear more than anything. Well, this is another thing in that Soviet system. So quote, this is from Michael Malice's book, The White Pill, which I'd highly suggest anyone reading. He said, the only reason that someone might feel the need to show mercy to those who were plotting against the Soviet regime would be some sort of sympathy with them or some sort of squeamishness about the party's process. Both were themselves clear grounds for arrest, and the interrogators, more than anyone else, knew exactly what that would entail. Getting confessions out of the accused thereby became a matter of life and death for the captors themselves. Evolutionary pressures encouraged the most evil and ruthless to succeed, since what was rewarded was not serving justice, but rather getting the prisoners to confess. So this goes 
to the same kind of idea where let's say you're just sitting on the fence and you're kind of going, okay, things are getting pretty crazy here in Canada or the West or wherever. And you see these people getting labeled far right like us or any of these other people that speak up against the way things are going. And you're faced with this option. I can either sympathize with them and say, you know what? I don't think that person is all that far right, or I don't think it's fair the way that they're being treated. But now all that does is give license to the far left activists to say, well, if you're sympathizing with those fascists, you must have some fascist ideals of within yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, one of the things I would say in today's world, because of our communication tools, the benefit you have is if they continue to ostracize groups, now feminists, now Catholics, the list goes on. I think they're going to get overwhelmed. I think they're going. So in the past, because they can control the communication tools better, I think they had more power. But because now, like how many more groups need to be ostracized till it's 10 against one ideology? Because I mean, you look at the, the volume of the feminists and Catholics, I don't know, it's gotta be a couple million people in this country, gotta be. You know, you look at it, you go, how many more of those groups have they already ostracized? Lots, right? So what, the, what happens when it gets to 10, 15 million Canadians? Because it's, gonna, it's going to get there. And then it's like, what power does this group have when they, this is why I was saying earlier, if you don't get everybody to team up with you and we've got all these communication tools and now we are going to team up against you, you're going to get beat eventually, right? And I, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how or when or whether it's quiet or whether it's violent. I have no idea. But when, when you kind of look at that, you're like, the more people you kick out of the back, off the back of the train, they're all on the same page now. And you see this, like you were seeing it over in the UK where Catholics and Protestants were, were, were protesting together against the immigration issue, right? So enemy my enemy is my friend, right? And that's how this is going to go because we're all kind of sick of this shit. So that's why I think like, you know, if we have to say good and evil, I think good will prevail over time in this situation because they are forcing everybody to team up together. And eventually I think they'll get overwhelmed. That's true. And I think people don't act until the consequences of these sorts of things are on their doorstep. Mm -hmm. And I think we're getting to that point now where whether it be the mass migration stuff, whether it be this woke institutionalization of, of their quote unquote values, which are terrible. Um, whether any of this kind of stuff, it's getting shoved down everybody's throat to the point where you can't avoid it anymore. And Hey, maybe the silver lining here is something that the Marxists in the early 20th century recognized about the West was that the reason Marxism wasn't taking hold in the West was because of our culture that it acted as a sort of uh, a wall to these ideas. And so who knows, maybe we'll see, but we're getting to that point now. So we'll see. Well, I also think just to wrap this up, I also think that we've got the political wind in our favor because I don't know what's going to happen in the States. If Kamala wins, they're going to be a spot of bother on this nonsense for some time. But Pierre Polyev wins here in Canada. He's against all this stuff. He really is. So having the political wind in your favor helps in a number of ways. First of all, it it sort of empowers people like us. Um, second of all, he's going to shut down some of this hard left-wing media stuff, right? And the thing is, these people don't bite the hand that feeds them. They've shown that. So CBC is defunded. Maybe he cuts funding to a lot of other organizations. He stops Bill C-18, Bill C-11. He cuts all that crap. And now it's not only do we have support, so we're a little more emboldened or or we're not under threat, perhaps, is a better way to look at it. Um, But we have all these tools again now, and it's a little bit more of an even playing field. And I think that's our opportunity to really cause some damage in terms of turning this over. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, uh, hopefully those winds change. Okay, moving on to our next story. We've got Canadian Border Security Agency whistleblower says transnational gangs have compromised government agencies, helping terrorists and spies enter Canada. Luke Sabrin, a former CBSA officer, alleges that the CBSA databases and operations have been compromised, aiding the entry of dangerous individuals into Canada. He describes a shocking case where a CBSA unit discovered a group of armed men smuggling illegal migrants across Quebec's border, only to have the incident covered up internally. Sabrin also alleges that in 2015, a senior CBSA manager ordered the illegal destruction of hundreds of foreign passports, some belonging to serious criminals, which could have aided their evasion of law enforcement. Despite reporting these issues to various government officials, including his local MP and the Prime Minister's office, Sabrin claims no action was taken. He warns that Canada's security is at risk due to systemic corruption and the failure of accountability measures. 
Sabrin's allegations align with concerns raised in a 2019 CBSA threat brief, which warned of transnational criminal organizations exploiting CBSA systems and personnel. Sabrin, along with a former colleague, believes these issues are part of a larger problem of corruption within the Canadian government. So has Canada become a playground for organized crime? It's been like this since, what, mid-2000, 2004, 2005, according to Sam Cooper, right? Actually, even if you go read Sam Cooper's book, Willful Blindness, which is great, he shows that a lot of this stuff even started happening in the 90s. Right, right, exactly. So look, we seem to be open for business to a lot of this stuff. Um, And look, I I understand that crime is its own economy. It has been for hundreds of years. You you get it. You understand that the government is probably going to be in coordination with them in some sense. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not super surprised about that, but for me, it's like that kind of stuff. I expect it to exist, but expect it to exist behind a curtain, not blatantly in situations like this. When these things happen, you have to take action or people like you and I don't trust our institutions anymore. We don't trust our institutions. Democracies is actually legitimately in trouble, right? And it just surprises me that this kind of stuff is continuing to happen. But I mean, when you have the Sinaloa cartel somehow baked into our government institutions and they're able to threaten a CBA officer's kids at his house, which happened to Sabra. When you, when you, when that happens, you're kind of going, oh, there's, there's no rules. You, you basically like, there's nothing left here for you. You know, if you work for one of the organizations in a, in a threat-based situation, you know, like I always say, if you want your institution to work, work for your institutions. That's pretty concerning. That's pretty like, I mean, honestly, I have a family. If I went and worked to the CBSA and someone knocked on my door and said, Mm-mm. see that little guy you want to see him again we're done here what do you what do you do i'm out like i'm out out give credit to this guy for even saying anything yeah I would he's, leave a, the he's a hero yeah 100 like i know it sounds hyperbolic or a little crazy but like i can't fight this in a little cartel i'm not stupid one to one all right let's beef bro but like if you've got a gang of people that can come into my country and do whatever you want and you have that kind of push and i'm the one that loses because other cbsa agents are compromised and giving my information up what the hell is happening here so yeah, no, I mean, like I said, all credit to the guy. Um, but I mean, I guess the better question is, can you fix it? How do you fix it? I think we need to fundamentally rethink the way that we allow ourselves to operate internationally. And I actually was just listening to a interview with uh, Harper the other day that was really interesting because the interviewer asked him about I guess at the time when this was being done, he was negotiating trade deals with China and people were on his case about how can you be a proponent of free trade while you're trying to limit trade with China because he was trying to put some sort of roadblocks up there, right? Tariffs or something? Uh, I think it was also just about how much people from China could operate within Canada. Right. Okay. Yeah. Those limitations are still there with our natural resources. Got it. That makes sense. And so what he was saying was that, yes, I am a very big proponent of free trade, but I don't recognize this as a free trade issue because what we've got is one country, aka China, operating different in how Canadians can engage with their economy than how Chinese nationals could engage with ours. Right. It's not reciprocal. That makes sense. And so it's like, it's okay. So people from China can come and operate in our economy however they want. They can invest in our housing. They can own housing. They can get into our uh, parliament people from from China. And actually, we've recently seen something Sam Cooper uh, outlined was that uh, MP Sean Chen was uh, met hanging out with, or sorry, photographed hanging out with a PRC, so Public uh, People's Republic of China military intelligence service operator recently. So they can do these kind of things, but then Canadians can't go over there and get into Chinese politics. You get thrown in jail over there. Yeah. yeah. Right so, away, you're two Michaels. Bye. And so it's not free trade or it's not democratic if it doesn't go both ways. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. I think a lot of times you look within the confines of our national borders and say, well, you guys say this is okay. Everybody should be able to do anything they want in here. But it's like on a macro scale in international or foreign foreign relations, shit, it has to go both ways in some sense. It's like, yes, you guys can do this here as long as we can do that there. But if it's if it's if it's um that that striking dichotomy like that, no, no chance. I agree with that. And so I think we need to reevaluate how we operate in regards to 
foreign countries, especially ones that are openly hostile to the Western world. And, and so, you know, we are at this point economically intertwined with China, but I think we should be on the path to limiting those sorts of things at all costs. And that's even what we're, we're doing with, um, with these international crime organizations, right? Is we understand now that the Chinese Communist Party government is openly facilitating and working with these criminal organizations. So it's it's all one and the same. And yeah, I think we maybe need to get a little bit more protective in the way that we deal with the outside world. I think that's a good way to deal with it. I think sort of putting up some economic barriers is a good start. Um, but I think it needs a multi-pronged approach. I think immigration is a big issue. I think you need to have um, like organizational overhauls. And I don't even know what that looks like. I honestly, I don't know. But if this kind of shit happens, like if a CSA, a CBSA agent is giving up someone else's address, knowing their kids are going to be threatened, that's deep rot. That's really, really bad. And if if managers are emboldened to destruct hundreds of foreign passports, knowing it will help us catch the bad guys, quote unquote, um, then you got to think about this in terms of the hierarchy and the power within it. So if the top level guys are doing corrupt shit, it doesn't mean the whole organization is, is wrought with corruption. It means that they're operating with somewhat, somewhat operating with impunity up here, but these people could still be like, these people could not know what's going on. They could be ignorant to the fact. It doesn't make it okay, but it means your organization can still be saved. But when you look at just a CBSA manager, that guy's got to be four or five rungs down and he's emboldened to do this kind of stuff. That tells you that, that corruption has infiltrated the entire, the entire organization other than maybe the boots on the ground. So, so at that point, like, I just don't know how you save something like this. I, I think it needs organizational overhaul, 100%. And I, you know, it is scary to push these kind of ideas because you can get into witch hunts. And I think that you need to avoid that at all cost because that is how you get something like, say, Stalin's purges, where they sifted through the government for anybody that had ideologies contrary or even just ideas contrary to the socialist revolution. So I don't think we should do it on a ideas based, but I do think we should be going and I hope Polyev has the balls to do something like this is just open a complete top to bottom. Like we are going to prioritize putting the people that have profited off of government corruption behind bars. And it's not about ideas. If you have, if you're sympathetic to socialist ideals, whatever. You get to obviously keep going on with your life. However, if you've been found to be helping foreign socialist countries undermine Canada, gone behind bars. It's interesting, right? Because you and I sometimes draw parallels to Bukele in El Salvador and Malay in Argentina, right? You we think Malay economically and Bukele really with the corruption. I think we need to lean a little bit towards how he's handling things in El Salvador. Like he is, he's like, everybody's in a room, all the politicians, hey guys, you're not all now under investigation for corruption. Mm -hmm. Good luck. We kind of need to get to that place. We do. And I think you got to start at the top down. And I, I just don't think you have a choice because otherwise we are just going to have to accept the fact that we are living with government corruption at all times, no matter what, you know, we just have to get to that point. And maybe it sounds again, maybe it's a little hyperbolic to do that to people. But if you push this and you incentivize, if you do this with your people, anybody that's guilty of corruption, like we said, we say minimum 10 years. You steal your stuff. You have to go live in the woods. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but then you start incentivizing. Exile to Nineveh. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, but then I think you have to sort of get people in the heads of departments doing the same thing, work their way down. Because the thing is, you may not catch everybody, but if people realize that there's a new sheriff in town in terms of, hey, there will be accountability and there will be severe penalties for this, this kind of shit's not going to happen as much. Well, and you even look at what they're doing in the UK, right? All it takes is locking up a few protesters before the whole nation shuts their mouth, maybe. I mean, I mean I'm sure it's working on some sort of scale. There'll also be people that probably continue to speak up, but it's the same kind of thing in here. You go up and you metaphorically string out or hang a couple people out to dry that are involved in corruption and you make them deal with the consequences, it'll then make everyone else that is actively engaging in corruption, even if they don't get caught, they'll start thinking, mm, maybe the consequences of doing what I'm currently doing exactly. are too great. That's I need exactly to, right. I need to cut this out. And just to, just to highlight though, we do draw parallels to the UK right now. I, I 
wholeheartedly disagree with how penal they're being in my protesting. Oh, for sure. So did that, but it, but it is, I do agree. It's just that like, I say this a lot and I sound like an ass, I'm sure sometimes like putting people in jail for corruption is right. Putting people in jail for protesting is wrong. I don't like what they're doing over there. I do like what they're doing here or what they would be doing here under this, under our, our idea. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, and mine wasn't, mine wasn't a uh, just supportive. A, yeah. It was just saying, hey, if their goal is to silence the nation, what they're doing will be is effective, effective in achieving yeah. their goal. Yeah, totally agree. This podcast is brought to you by Higher Healths. Today, I want to talk to you about something that's made a real difference in my health journey, organ supplements. Recently, I was asked why I even take organ supplements. What benefits do they offer? How are they different from other vitamins? And how do I know they aren't just filler? So here are some of the benefits and why I get mine from Higher Healths. Organ supplements provide high levels of vitamin A, C, D, and E, as well as zinc and selenium, which are crucial for maintaining and boosting your immune system. With high levels of omega-3 fatty acids, choline, and antioxidants like CoQ10, organ supplements support memory, mental clarity, brain health, and heart health. Organ supplements also elevate your mood and energy levels, naturally balance your hormones, boost your metabolism, and support weight management. As for why I choose Higher Healths, their organ supplements are sourced from 100% grass-fed, grass-finished cattle raised by Canadian regenerative farmers. I also have a personal relationship with the founders, Nigel and Darren, who created this company to tackle their own health problems. So perhaps the better question is, why aren't you taking them yet? Improve your health with nature's multivitamin. Head over to higherhealths.ca and use promo code BLENDER, that's capital B-L-E-N-D-R, for a 10% discount on any bundle purchase. Higher Healths, connecting people to real food. Okay, moving on to the next story. We've got liberals plan to redistribute immigrants to small town Canada. The federal liberals plan to redirect immigrants and newcomers from major cities to rural areas in northern Ontario and western Canada, as revealed by recently obtained documents. These plans are part of the Rural and Northern Immigration Plot launched launched in 2019, which aimed to help newcomers settle in smaller communities to support economic development. The pilot included cities like Thunder Bay, Sudbury, and Moose Jaw. A memo to Immigration Minister Sean Frazier suggests expanding this initiative is part of a broader strategy to regionalize immigration. The government redacted much of the memo, including the number of immigrants involved, indicating the sensitivity of the data. Additionally, the memo acknowledges negative reactions from provinces and territories and highlights the need to address the low birth rates and aging populations in these conservative-leaning towns. So is mass migration a viable solution to Canada's aging population? So it's interesting. Um, You made a really good point the other day about economics in this situation and why these governments are pushing open borders and mass migration. And like you said, they they sort of um, live and die by their social programs, which are again, wrought with corruption. The CPP, the, the just, just to quickly, if you had your money invested into a index fund earning 8% a year, the amount of money you have to put into CPP, the average person puts in is about 155,000 around there. At the end of that, at the, when you retired after 40 years, 25 to 65, you'd have over a million dollars in your bank, over a million dollars that you'd get on day one. Do what you want to do with it, pass it down to the kids, whatever. If you collect CPP, which is what everybody has, you're forced into doing this. You have to live to be 82 years old just to get your $155,000 back on average. It is such bullshit. I, it gives me, I have such a problem with it. Anyway, um, I feel the same way about the old age security, a lot of other problems we have here, but they need to bolster immigration because we're getting off kilter in terms of the people that are requiring the social programs and the people that are funding them. So from an economic perspective, the migration makes sense if you're the government and you're thinking non-emotionally. Um, that may be why uh, they're pushing, I think they're gonna be over 500,000 this year for immigration for permanent residents. So they yeah. were saying, you know, their goal was 485. Looks like they're gonna be around 511 or 512,000 this year. 511, yeah. Yeah, so, and, and whatever they're doing for non permanents I don't even know what that looks like. Probably, probably we're gonna be around 1.5 again, which is pretty crazy because there's gotta be this point where you go infrastructure versus volume. And I think we're way outside the infrastructure thing. So it seems like their social programs are hurting so bad that they're willing to sacrifice the economy today to make sure that they can bolster those programs. Anyway, that's what it seems like. That's what that that's that's what their strategy appears to be. I mean, you see in the UK, there's a lot more violence here. We don't have the same thing. Sure, some people slip through the cracks that are that are terrorists and stuff like that, as we know. But in general, it just seems to be a bad economic impact more than anything. And I believe that is why they're doing it. I'm very much on the same page as you right now. In terms of redistributing them into small towns, what else are they going to do? Like, like I look, 
Toronto is overly congested at this well, point. What's you, I mean? like, 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 you like, have to. Like Ontario is getting 41% of the immigrants, 41%. So you think about that, like that's, that's pretty significant. I mean, for, uh, that's, you know, over 600,000 people a year right now, right? So you kind of, if, if my 1.5 number is correct. So when you think about that, you kind of go, where are they going to go? Like most people go to the thriving metropolis that is the GTA. You know, there's, I say there's 5 million people in that area. That's my guess, around five. You throw 600,000 people in there every year that you just can't keep up. So what else are they going to do? And I know people don't love it and, and, and whatever it is, but I don't think there's another solution if you're going to pour this many people into the country. <laughs> just think, can you imagine being a person living in a foreign country in dreaming about making it to Canada and like being part of the big boom in metropolis and all this kind of stuff. And then you get here and they're like, you're going to Thunder Bay. <laughs> <laughs> you just being like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? Getting uh, there, just being like, this is what I came It's here? way too cold at Thunder yeah. Bay. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's not going to work for me, pal. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's, I don't like it, but if I'm being pragmatic, I understand it. Yeah. And one thing I was thinking about in regards to this is if you think the pushback against immigration is bad now, wait until, again, it gets on the doorstep of the people who don't like it most, yeah. aka rural Canada, the conservative-leaning small towns. Yes. Right now, they're very vocal about it, and they haven't been dealing with it nearly as much as the, the city dwellers have. And now you start pumping the immigrants into their communities. Yeah. Their their disapproval is only going to grow. Go up. So I have I have a I have someone I know that's around eighty years old, um, small town, uh, great human being. They had some some recent immigrants move in next to them, and they say they're they're nice enough, but they're like culturally it's it's wild. Mm -hmm. so like it is completely different. They do they have no real respect for the location. They're they're doing stuff without building permits. They're just kind of making a bit of a mess of the neighborhood. And now these people, like this person, super kind, won't really, you know, surprised they even said it to me. I think we were just having a conversation about this kind of stuff. Um, but it was interesting, like even the quiet people that are very kind and decent and have been somewhere, and don't get me wrong, people, everybody, everybody, you know, at one point or another immigrated to Canada somehow. So we're all, we're all sort of a foreign story in some way. So it is what it is. But like you and I talk about, it's the cultural difference mm -hmm. because everyone in the neighborhood is uncomfortable and it has nothing to do with, with, with the ethnicity of the people has to do with the culture and how they behave. So yeah, I mean, it's like firsthand, it's, this is what it's gonna be like. Going to that economic point of immigration, and I'd just be interested in hearing on your thoughts here, do you think that that's just a symptom of the fact that they are importing a new tax base in order to keep their social programs alive? I less and less believe it has anything to do with race, but that this is just the or or like cultural replacement and that this actually just that's like an unintended consequence or even too, if you think about it, let's say you are a policymaker and you know, OK, we have to completely rebuild our tax base. Otherwise, we have to get rid of pension plans and all of this stuff. We can't. In, and you're wondering how to market that, you can't walk to the public and say, hey guys, uh, just a heads up, if we don't import the third world, like your pensions are gone. So we're going to do this program because then people would probably start pushing back against it. So then the original aim isn't say the cultural aspect or the ethnicity aspect, but that becomes the thing is like, Hey, we need to, because there was we no need narrative. to be so compassionate. And yes. then that's, that's like your branding. That's your marketing sales point to people yes. and say, we, we should do this because we're compassionate towards these cultures. What I such. think they did was they go, we either tell them it's economics or we tell them it's about compassion because if we, which one's going to be worse for us yeah. and they go, Oh, the economics, we got to tell them it's about compassion and they're bad if they don't do it. Cause you can win that culture war. Right. Right. Um, I totally think it's a symptom because if you think about it, let's say you're like, okay, well, we need to bring a bunch of people in. Where do all the white people live? Western nations. The Western nations are doing pretty well. White people won't get up and leave and move to Canada for what? What would they move here for? You know what I mean? Some people do, sure, but like we don't have a lot of economic opportunity. They've already probably, probably got it pretty good where they are. Our weather's not that great. Our politics are a disaster. So you think about it, you're like, well, people in the developed world, why would they come here? What, what would be the purpose? So yeah, you, you like, if you think about low hanging fruit and volume and what you actually want are employees, you don't really want entrepreneurs, which our government has made very clear. 
then yeah, you're going to be importing the third world, second and third world, 100%. And they're going to be coming at scale. So yeah, I mean, I think it's just a symptom of how do we fix this problem? And that's that was the low hanging fruit. And you know, they've already put the country in such a bad spot that I don't think they had any other choice than to go for that demographic. Well, here's, so here another, we are. here's another thought on that, that, pat, that thought line is, let's say you know that your mass migration is inevitably going to cause mayhem and institutional decay from what it currently is. Now, your goal is to keep these things alive to some degree, and you're trying to stop them from just having to completely go away. But okay, so you know that these policies are going to lead to a decline in the living standards. Well, I can't import people that have a high bar for their living standards right. where, yeah, maybe Canada becomes 50% worse than it has been for the last century, but it's still 25% better than the countries where the sub-Saharan Africans are coming from. Exactly. And so they won't notice that our institutions are going to shit because it's still better than what they left. Or it just won't be bad enough for them to make that change. I forget what that's called, but you always do. Um, when it's bad and oh, it's bad, beta bad region enough. paradox. Yeah, the old yeah. beta region paradox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, that makes the most sense. It's like, yeah, if you have to think, hey, what's the low hanging fruit, but also how do we stop them from being like, I'm out of here? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's interesting. I mean, I guess it's cyclical. And I think it's one of the first times we've seen, like, because the boomers were the largest generation of seeing this kind of flip the other way. And and this is something like I'm not intelligent enough to have seen this coming from a macroeconomic perspective before we got here. I just never really thought about it because I didn't realize how our, I didn't know enough about how our social programs are working and how inefficient government spending was until the last five years or and so. And even just population <clears throat> fine. Yeah, yeah, to totally. But it's, yeah, so, so well, that thing too, like we could have also been, we've had, a, we've had a, a negative birth rate for a really long time. You like in Canada, I think for like 30, 30 years maybe. And it also, Decline, actually, yeah. it actually wasn't even, it's been declining for the last 30 years. Yeah. But if you go look at the major drop off, it was in the 1960s after the legalization and widespread adoption of contraception, right. abortion practices, and women entering the workplace. Before that, uh, we know this from the baby boomer generation. Before that, roughly every woman was roughly having four children. Within a decade of those policies being implemented, the birth rate dropped to under two, which is less than replacement. Rate. Yeah, when was that? In the 1960s. And okay, it was, yeah, that's so what I was trying to find if out. If you actually go look, it, I, I wrote about this all in an article on our Substack. 1971. Canada's birth rate fell below two children per woman in 1971. So it's been over 50 years. So yeah, so over 50 years. And if you go look again, it's like from 1960 to 1970 is when it plummeted from four to under two. And so that's not just like a slow decline where over time, your tax base is slowly shrinking and yeah. maybe you can manage that decline a little bit. Yeah, you can play but with when, the numbers. But now when all of a sudden you've got those people that were born pre-1960s entering yeah. into withdrawing from their pension plans, yeah. you're, you've now got like a, a massive inversion of population. Yeah, I just think the state should stay out of it. I think if they'd done what I said and been like, hey, just invest half the money, get out with like half a million when you're retired. Mm -hmm. Here's what you do, leave it in the private sector. No problem. And so here's another thing that I've been thinking about a lot in regards to this is, okay, it would be probably mayhem. Humans are short-sighted, so it probably would be mayhem if you didn't have some sort of requirement for pension plans because people don't think that far ahead. Sure. I'm as guilty of this as anybody. Sure. Um, so you want those things in place so that you don't have a mass amount of elderly poverty because that becomes its own issue for society. But I've been thinking there's a massive difference between government requiring you to do something and government providing you that. So government could say, you have to do something for a pension. Yes. You are required to do some sort of retirement planning. Yes. But that doesn't mean that we need to provide you that pension. Well, well exactly. Like, like I say, this is maybe the most corrupt program we have. We, if you invest $150,000 over the span of 40 years, you have to live to be 82 from 65 to 82 to get your money back. Where we know at the day of 65, that should be worth more than a million. So the government is literally taking eight to $900,000 from every single person that's going through this program. This is highway fucking robbery. All we need is someone to get in there who understands economics and for Canada and the government to stop being assholes to Canadian citizens. That's what you need. Do you know if that number factors in inflation as well? Because it would only be worse. Let's say 
let's say I give you $150,000 over my 40 years of working. Yeah. And then you give me $150,000 back and my 10 years of retirement. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's, then, it's not factored and in. You it's factor actually worse. It. No, I was going to say, worse. and then, so you're yeah. not even just getting your money no. back because if you consider, a, let's say, the average of a 4% yes. inflation rate every year, yes. I'm your imagine, purchasing yeah. power is actually getting massively So when, when they give you those figures, they give you them in today's numbers, so they try to make them equal. But yes, in reality, that's not how it would pan out. No, because you'd be investing the money at today's number and then inflation would work its way along. And they argue, they're like, oh, well, you get 2% back. It's like, guys, what are you talking about? You got to live to be basically 85 to get 2% back. Plus it's not compounded like the money you have to put in every month or every couple of weeks. So it is it is the worst. Our social programs are just horrible when it comes to stuff like this. Which is hilarious to think that it was pretty much Canada's only marketing pitch on the international stage was look at how great our healthcare and our social programs and stuff yeah. are. Yeah. Well, it's just, yeah, anyway. <laughs> it's insane. Oh, one one last thing before I thought before we move on here is uh, Olivia Chow has now made an announcement that Toronto is a sanctuary city and quote, the city is committed to supporting all residents regardless of immigration status. Quote, join us on August 20th for undocumented residence day event and learn about the realities, challenges, and contributions undocumented Torontonians make to our city. We're now literally making holidays for illegal immigrants. So <laughs> you want to know what the sanctuary cities look like? Just take a look at New York over the last two years. Yeah. See how that goes. At least Mayor Adams had the balls to be like, hey guys, this isn't working. And Chow's like, let's throw them a party. <laughs> what a fucking mental case. Um, also, you want to know how bad they have it? How much was it they get every year? Each immigrant, each illegal immigrant um, gets like $86,000 a year. It's more than the average Canadian family brings home um, because of the hotels and all the food and everything they need. I think that was about the number. Yeah, I think I'm good. <laughs> so I think I don't need to be celebrating that. Thanks, she's, she's such a clown too that uh, she was... She was dancing in uh, Caravana gear, looking like I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, it was you, you were it was not, actually you, uncomfortable. I couldn't watch it. I felt uncomfortable. You should not. Yeah, you I'm should out. not have that on. Not for me. But not then for me. there's hilarious. probably some 75 year old Asian dudes who are like, "Hey, give me some." <laughs> That's just not where I'm at. So for me, it was uncomfortable. <laughs> What was hilarious was she was doing that on Saturday, but then on Monday she was dressed in full hijab for a Muslim community. It's like, oh, I'm gonna go party with the Carabana, which She's would the be the Asian woman Trudeau. What are you yeah. doing, bro? Yeah. <laughs> what are you trying to pull right now? <laughs> Fucking blackface is next, and she yeah. gets pulled off. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> uh, all right, she's all spearheading right. a BLM right. <laughs> 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 so good <laughs> Fucking clown, clown world man that's uh, funny funny uh, shit all right moving on to our next story we've got feds urging businesses to prepare for new virus pandemic with gas and food shortages the canadian center for occupational health and safety has released an updated guide urging businesses to prepare for a pandemic caused by a hypothetical new virus that could lead to significant disruptions in food and fuel supplies the second edition of the flu and infectious disease outbreaks business continuity plan handbook <laughs> emphasizes the need for businesses to plan for extreme scenarios, including widespread workforce absences and disruptions to essential services. The guide also anticipates multiple pandemic waves and advises employers to prepare for reduced labor, supply chain issues, and potential shortages in essential services. So what would Canada's economy look like if it had to be limited by public health restrictions again? Uh, I don't think there'd be anything left. I think there'd be no choice See, that's interesting. There'd be no choice but to go to uh, government dependency. I mean, I'd be gone, gone, gone. I'd be out, 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 out. I'll see that coming. I'm out, gone. I'll just take all my stuff, put it in the car, drive across the border. Don't care. Um, you just keep driving probably to Mexico. It'd be safer. Um, <laughs> Actually, I was going to say one thing that, uh, that our audience members have, have said a couple of times is whenever we talk about this is, uh, is, well, where would you guys go? So on our sub stack, we actually have an episode where we talked about that for 30 minutes. So if you're interested in that, head over to our sub stack and you can figure that out there. Yeah. Any, right. Anyway, I would sorry say, to interrupt. No, no, you're good. I think just pandemic base, I'd go to Mexico. <laughs> I just think that'd be the safest place for now. Um, as far as the economy goes, like, we can't handle it. So that's why I think this stuff is more inflammatory uh, and sensationalized than real because the people running the country want power. And if you put us through another pandemic right now, um, the country, it would, it would, it actually can't handle it. 
So I think the economic fallout would be so significant. Um, I just don't know what there would be left to rule. I don't know. I think you'd have chaos. I think you'd have a real, real problem in this country if you got locked down for any significant amount of time. Um, so I, I, to be quite honest with you, I think if it did happen, um, there'd be no small business left in Canada. I think everything would be subsidized by the government. I think everyone would be big corporations. I think Canada would feel like a second world country. That's what I think. Um, but if I'm being honest, I think they know we can't handle it. So I don't think it's happening. We'll see. I mean, at this point, I would put nothing by these people as to the amount of insanity that they're that they're able to achieve, whether they know the consequences of certain policies like this or whether they are just ignorant of them. I mean, you know, this was something even at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Once this stuff went on for a couple months, like two or three months, Now, I'm no economic genius, and this is why it's so concerning, is because I have, like, say, maybe a the equivalent understanding of economics is somebody that went to university for it for one year, like not even a degree. But if I have that knowledge, and I knew within a couple months of the pandemic in the money printing and shutting down small businesses that this was going to have ripple effects for five to ten years minimum, yeah, then what do these economic the like our finance minister christia freeland is she actually just so out to lunch that no, she doesn't well, know she, these things she's or got a master's she... in, a, in an obscure russian language i think so <laughs> her understanding of economics is non-existent yeah Clear, clearly i mean i think jean-yves duclos who's bounced around from minister to minister position rather um he actually has an economics degree yeah right, you yeah. know if you got to pick your guy that's probably the guy i would put there you know what i mean but but uh, as, as far as i you know what i will say this Ministers are put in positions without any real skill set for the job they're given. It's all about just reshuffling the cabinet so you don't know who to keep being pissed off at. That's what this is mainly about. Anyway. Yeah, it's true. But so, okay, you go to that idea where I don't think these people are interested in economics, understanding it, of actually bringing economic prosperity, any of these things. I don't think they're they interested. Power, in, though. They're interested in power. And that's I, it. I, my concern is if you do this again, what is their... I, I just don't think they can maintain it. I don't think they've got a chance. That's all I'm saying. Now, no, here, here, here's the other side of the argument. Well, Jonathan, you said multiple times that Canada could see Trudeau win another election if he uses universal basic income. Now, we may not be in a vulnerable enough position for people to buy into universal basic income. But if something like this happened again and they did lock us down, and like I said, we'd have no choice but to subsidize everything by the government, maybe it's the only solution left. And then it becomes, keep me voted in or you don't keep getting your allowance. So it could, it could go that way, but that is too nation specific. And I believe that when you look at something locking us down like this, it would have to be global. Mm-hmm. So I think it would be a benefit that Canada or that Trudeau might use but you can't create that kind of leverage in your own government. You need the world to shut down. Right. And again, it's just because I actually need to say steel man the other side, because I do think that is a good, good uh, concept or a good practice to do is, okay, hey, maybe this is just the Canadian government sitting here after one pandemic going, these are the measures or the ideas that we should put in place that would, if the next time a pandemic came across, hopefully we'll just be a little bit more prepared for it. Right. That, that is maybe the most charitable idea that you can give to them. Totally. Totally. I mean, I think it's, I think it's inflammatory and you shouldn't be saying this to small business owners right now that still can't dig out of the hole you created. Yeah. You know, all you're doing is creating more fear, but I agree with you for, if you're sitting on your, if you're sitting in sort of your ivory tower as a politician or one of these groups that has continued to make more money and just got a pay raise through all this while the rest of us suffer, the only thing growing is the public sector. You might go, Oh, this is good. They they need this. They'll be ready for next time because we'll give them this piece of information. Yeah. Not going, oh, this is just going to scare the shit out of people that have nothing left. Great. Yeah. Or, like, I mean, you could even look at it like something, say, say you're Japan, you could put out safety notices for businesses how as to how to operate in the face of a tsunami if if, if sure. mass floodings occur sure. or something like that. Sure. But doesn't, talk- it doesn't mean they're going to go try to cause a tsunami to under to flip over businesses. Oh, but that's true. No, that's true. But I'll, I'll say this. If this is how government's spending their money, stop doing it. Yeah. We don't need this shit. Mm-hmm. People already know what happens when a pandemic comes to life. And you, we, we saw it. We're all suffering because of it, mainly because of government decision. So don't tell us we need to be prepared for it. If you do it again, you need to be overthrown. That's what we actually need to do.
All right. Our next story, we've got 15 year old boy is the first in England to be charged with rioting offenses. So a 15 year old from Sunderland is the first person in England to be charged with riot following unrest in the country. Originally charged with violent disorder and burglary, his case was upgraded after new evidence emerged. The boy appeared in South Tyneside Youth Court, where his case was adjourned until September. The charge of riot carries a maximum penalty of 10 years in prison. The Crown Prosecution Service has now charged 413 individuals related to the recent riots, protesting the fatal stabbings of three girls in Southport. So will these measures achieve their aims of scaring the native British population into submission? Hard to say. It goes one of two ways, really, right? It goes, yes, everybody shuts up. Or you have violent revolution constantly until the, the prime minister steps down. Um, I hate to say it, but I kind of vote for the latter because I think, you know, if you don't stand up to these totalitarian measures, right now you can't protest against immigration. What's next? So all these people that are pro-immigration, they're like, yeah, get those guys. Except you will be on the chopping block eventually. It's like free speech. The other shoe's going to drop. You're going to be on the other side of the fence. You don't want these tools in place. Hopefully enough people see this. I think that there are enough people that are pissed off by this, but here's when we're really going to find out if these measures achieve their aims. When the next really big incident happens with some sort of foreigner, that's when you're going to see if this works. Because when if someone does something like this again, I understand the guy was from the UK. He was of ethnic descent from, what was it? Um, Rwanda. He was of Rwandan um, ethnicity, but he was UK citizen. Cool. Um, but if this something like this happens... There have been multiple stabbings by people that were refugees and asylum seekers in that country over the last few years. It's been pretty bad. Ireland had a couple of bad spouts of it too. So it's not, this isn't an isolated incident for those who think that this is just a bunch of right-wing people acting crazy. This is not at all. This hit a boiling point. That's what this was. The next incident that involves um, a refugee, asylum seeker, or a recent immigrant, um, then we're going to see. We're going to see if these aims actually can achieve uh, their goal or if you see that violent revolution. Not only has there been incidents of violent crime from these uh, from mass migration, but this goes to that point of it being a two tier justice system. So, like, okay, if this guy did break into, I, I am very for property rights. So, hey, if this fifteen year old boy did break into something and burglarize and vandalize somebody's property. I do think there should be consequences totally in agreed. that scenario. Totally agreed. The difference is, is that those consequences never get levied against the people that they're protesting. Right. This is where things get really crazy. Let's forget the 15-year-old boy who, it seems, did actually burglarize something. This is, this is how insane things have gotten UK. So a judge now brands man a bigot and puts him in jail over Facebook riot posts. A plasterer who admitted to stirring up racial hatred on Facebook has been sentenced to 21 months in prison. 21 months, almost two years in prison for private messages with friends where I, I don't know what the messages were, even if they are terribly racist. I don't think you should go to jail for two years for a private message you wow. send your friends. That's insane. That's in, that is insane. And what's really crazy to think about is how did the government in the put, UK put Ofcom built a back door? The, Ofcom has built a back door into things that are supposed to be encrypted. That's already been that's out in the open, man. So these people have a back door into it, like your WhatsApp, your whatever. And you know Facebook's towing the line on these things. Elon will not. Everyone else seems to be doing it. So there becomes those those are the two options. Okay. Either that means the government is privately surveilling or sorry, surveilling private messages which of their citizens, openly, we know this, which they are, or somebody in his friend group ratted him out to the government. Yeah. And this is, again, something that happens if if you know history, no matter where these things have been implemented, when mass surveillance programs and thought policing starts being implemented people start ratting themselves or people, even their loved ones out. I believe it was in Eastern Germany. The stat is that roughly one third of citizens were government informants or had informed on another citizen to the government at some point. That's wild. So that means if you have a family of six sitting around a dinner table, statistically speaking, two of them are selling out people to the government. 
And so this is exactly that maybe could be what happened here is friends go, if you know that, okay, if the government is surveilling our private messages and they find that our group has been sending around racist memes or whatever, then they could, by association, lock us all up. So I better get ahead of this and make sure he goes to jail That's and not dark. me. That reminds me of the pandemic when they're like, rat on your neighbors for having people over who will rip apart the fabric of a nation by doing that in each neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Crazy, crazy road we're going down here. In a totalitarian society, the citizens are just as guilty as the regime themselves because they all end up participating in this kind of thing. Oh, absolutely. It becomes a every man for themselves in terms of security, so they'll throw everyone else under the bus. It's mm -hmm. very dark, but I just don't know how you stop society from getting there. I like to think that people have the individual strength to not do it, but I feel like everybody's got a line, and most people's is not that far down the road. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm a little bit more uh, I'm with you. standoffish I, oh, about yeah, this. Oh, yeah, 100%. Just because because, you know, okay, let's look at a recent scenario. I've loosely referenced this a couple times on the podcast before, but when I was working at that bar and uh, for four months, didn't have an issue with anybody, got along great with everyone. And four months into my employment there, a queer woman found my social media pages and said that I, it's people like me that are directly responsible for the hate crimes that she has been, or that she has suffered. And after they launched a Maoist style struggle session against me in the establishment and tried to drum up hate towards me, uh, the thing they accused me of, right? Then it led to my girlfriend at the time breaking up with me because they bullied her into it, right? So that, I'll be honest, that was a defining moment for me, not because I sat there and I went, oh, I'm so sad my relationship has ended because part of me is like, okay, if you were that week going, anyway it's okay then that's fine but it really illuminated to me in that moment and this is something she said to me while breaking up with me was she's like i understand that you are nothing like what they call you and she was pretty sympathetic to social justice causes but to have somebody stand in front of me because i think you can i can understand uh, the position an individual would be in if they don't have actual information against somebody and they support canceling them or attacking them. Let's say they've just read a headline and the news headline says far right bigot does this. And then th there's an attack against them. And you can kind of understand how somebody that has only read that headline wouldn't have sympathy for the person getting attacked or wouldn't stand up for them. But then to see in that scenario that this girl who told me she has never been treated so well by a man and that she that it actually kind of made her feel like imposter syndrome over how well I treated her to then turn and go, but they're labeling you a misogynist and I can't live with that. So to go, they're calling you a misogynist. I know you're the actual antithesis of this. I know that that's not your character, but I have to go along with this cancellation anyways. That to me, that to me was like, I just, her social I, status is more important than her individual happiness. That, Liam's, Liam's single, by the way, that was a good pitch. <laughs> I'm the best guy you're ever going to meet. But I lost, a, I actually lost a lot of faith in humanity in general at that point, because well, I, I feel, don't, because yeah. I don't, I don't think she was an exception. I think she's the rule. And yeah. I think, I think majority of people will do that. I think so too. I think we saw a lot of it through the pandemic. I think we see a lot of it every single day when people agree with this nonsense, like just take the gender ideology stuff and what they're doing to children. Anybody that says that's not mutilation and super dangerous and harmful and should be shut down immediately, you're buying into bullshit ideology. And for those that think that I'm wrong, just go look what's happening in the UK right now. Look what's happening all through Europe. They're like, oh, whoa, we got this way wrong. We need to stop immediately. So now we have all the scientific evidence. But here in Canada, they still go, no, it's kind. It's just, it's what's best for the children. Guys, you're just buying into some stupid social construct. Back out now. So yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. It's just, I think um, a lot more people, are, at least, I think at least the, the loudest group of people are like that. And they convince all these other people that are kind of on the fence that if they don't do these things or don't buy into these really bad ideas, um, they'll be socially ostracized. You know, and, and, and in fairness, like she's in Toronto. Toronto's the melting pot for this nonsense yeah. in Canada, right? Toronto's the worst city in this country for all that stuff, right? And they let so many people in, like we said earlier, how can they be against any of these things, right? If you live there, you buy in wholesale or you get the hell out. So you're dating someone from there. It's kind of on you. You know, you, you, you know now, but it's like, that's what you should expect if you're in that city. Sure, there are people that see it the other way. And I know there's some good women there. I don't mean it like that, but. Yeah. 
<laughs> you, but you know what I'm saying? If someone's in the thick of it and they buy in and they're they're yeah. they're sympathetic to social justice causes and they are in Toronto, like, hey man, what did you think you were getting? It's like the equivalent of a Toronto fuckboy. It's like, sweetheart, what did you think you were getting into? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, you know, you, you learn from it, but anyway, this is what it is. When it comes to this group thing, and this is why, again, I don't think it's, I don't think it's everybody, but I think it is the majority of people. It goes to that ASH compliance test, that that famous study that was done where they found that only 20 to 30% of individuals would give the right answer in a room of people giving an obviously wrong answer. So if, if seven people said that a obviously shorter line was the longest line on the chalkboard, then you know most people would go along with it. There is a select few that are willing to stand up and say no, that's wrong. But it, but it's a minority. The problem with that is though, is if the majority of the people are willing to go along with a lie or with just groupthink in general. Yeah. This is where things can get so crazy because let's say you have a group of people, and we'll take it outside of the social justice stuff for a minute. And let's say it's just you and a group of six people are trying to decide where to go to dinner. And nobody really wants to bring everybody to somewhere that only they would enjoy or that yeah. be make the wrong choice for the group. But one person kind of stands up and says, let's go to XYZ spot thinking that it would make the most people happy. And everybody goes along because they don't want to be the one to say no to that. And so you can all end up at a restaurant which might not have been the desired place of anybody in yeah. that group just because one person said it thinking other people wanted it and then they agreed to it and they didn't actually want it. That's exactly what happens in this scenario yep. as well. And, and it's just this like delusion that goes on and everybody buys into it. It's like that old Joe Rogan joke. It's like the loudest retard in the room wins. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking do. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is, man. <laughs> That's yeah, great. Uh, <laughs> all right. Our last story for the day. We've got CBC paid over $18 million in bonuses in 2024 after it eliminated hundreds of jobs. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation paid out $18.4 million in bonuses for the 2023-24 fiscal year, despite eliminating hundreds of jobs. The bonuses were distributed among 1,194 employees with $3.3 million going to 45 executives, averaging over 73000 per executive. This amount exceeds the median family income after taxes in Canada for 2022. The CBC board approved these bonuses in June, but has not disclosed the exact figures, despite repeated inquiries from Parliament. The layoffs included 141 employees and the elimination of 205 vacant positions. So how does it make you feel as a taxpayer to be funding the bonuses of a failing propaganda machine? This is just, you know, this is one of those funny things that the liberals should stop doing because it makes them look so bad. You know, in the grand scheme of things, $18 million, given our, our annual federal budget of about $550 million in that range, it's dropping a bucket. It's, it's, it's inconsequential. But they're wearing this on the face because everyone knows this is just their propaganda tool. And, you know, a couple of things I'd highlight. There was a recent study that came out, and I believe it was 61.1% of Canadians want the CBC defunded, at least partially. Mm -hmm. Most of them, I think it was about 50-50 in terms of partial versus fully. The only people that wanted to stick around are the boomers and whatever. Then I, I get it. But so, so Canadians don't want this, obviously. Um, the other thing I would say is layoffs. I was reading this thing recently where they're like, well, we cut, you know, like 350 employees. We deserve bonuses because we tightened up the ship. We, you know, this is how big corporations work. I go, actually, improving the efficiency of an operation to improve, to increase your bottom line. That does, you do deserve a bonus for that, except this company is losing money hand over fist and is just funded by taxpayers. It's a completely different landscape. You're, you're cutting all these jobs because you're dying, not because you want to become more efficient and improve your bottom line for your investors. We are your investors. We don't want you to begin with, and everything you're doing is failing. So, I mean, their, their biggest asset is real estate holdings. This is such a joke. So what is crazy to consider is that Catherine Tate, the CEO of CBC, makes roughly $450,000 annually. Plus her bonus. And then her bonus is up to 28% of her base salary, which translates up to 145,000. So- She's making nearly 600K a year. Off the taxpayers. Yep, off the taxpayers. To run a propaganda machine into the ground. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that the other day. We don't actually have any really, really good digital news platforms in this country. We don't have any. 
right or left. We just don't. You know what I mean? Like there are some pretty good ones in the States. They're all terrible here. My point in saying this is CBC is just not keeping up with technology and no one wants to pay attention to them. What was you that told me? They've had a podcast longer than us and they're not, yeah. even, they're, yeah. they're not even close to as many views as you and I get. And they have a budget of $1.4 billion annually. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you think about it from... They should give us that 1.4 billion. We'll we'll become the people's give me propaganda. Give me 18.4. It'll be fine. We'll, <laughs> we'll become the people's propaganda. Damn man. <laughs> for 18.4 million dollars, that's all I would need. All I need is their bonus structure for a year, and I'm I'm set. Yeah, I crush this. Wild man. <laughs> you know, anyway. So crazy. Yeah, it's wild. But you think about it, say from an organizational standpoint too. Okay, the internet came along and massively changed the media landscape and just information landscape in general. And all of these big corporations, like say the CBC, if you think about them like a tanker ship, if something comes out of the blue, they can't just whip us. They can't do anything. No. Whip the helm around. You and I are in a speedboat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so that's kind of the benefit, I guess, of keeping operations smaller is you're more nimble. And that's actually something you and I have talked about where we were like, okay, the goal is to grow Blender News to the point where we can actually affect change in Canada. Unfortunately, we need funds for that. So uh, subscribe to the Substack. We don't even need $18.4 <laughs> million. I'll we'll say like 10% of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but you and I did talk about it early on where we said, okay, let's try to really grow this thing, but grow it in a way where the operations can be done with like five to 10 people max and then that way you are flexible. Yeah. And, and two, because even in the CBC is definitely guilty of this, is at a certain point, once you have operations for that, like you have entire departments that are just meaningless. In re- Absolutely. Like a hundred percent. Again, like you said, because technology changes so much. So it's, yeah, it's just they refuse to. It's like you said, they refuse to downsize to a cruise ship. They still want to be a tanker. Yeah. It makes no sense. But the thing is, their budget continues to grow. So what's the incentive? And they keep getting bonuses. So what's the incentive? It makes no sense. But now they've got themselves to the point now. No, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't remember. I, I don't remember any prime minister ever saying fully defund these idiots. Yeah. But this is what they've done to themselves. If someone in, in leadership had said, no, 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 no. Like, for example, if I'd led the company, I'd be like, okay, guys, we can minimize this budget. Let's change the strategy. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to win back people's trust. This is how this is going to operate. You know, you could do the whole thing with less than half the budget. You know what I mean? And then then the conservative government comes along and they don't want anything to change. You just keep going. It's like the if you want the business to continue to thrive, you just make the right moves. But they all got greedy. So the nice thing is they're all going to pay dearly. So let them have their bonuses because they're all going to be able to work very shortly. In these socialist states, what ends up happening with their propaganda machines is they inevitably end up declining in viewership and readership because even if people don't understand these things deeply, people have a generally good radar as to when they're being bullshitted. Yes. The difference is is that some people, even if they are able to understand that they're being bullshitted, they'll still go along with it for some reason reason because which people is, it's shattering their opinions that people yeah. are good with that plus it's once you identify with something you're pretty much pooched i mean if you if you do that kind of, i don't really do that at all but as soon as you do people they just dig their claws in right yeah and so all of these places in these in these socialist countries they're both not even just their media but their art industry just tanks as well because nobody's interested in having propaganda shoved through down their throats through art no i mean we saw it in cnn as well right yeah. like you saw it in the states people were like oh yeah nobody trusts them anymore it was interesting they did a lot of stuff through the pandemic which is pretty terrible but i think what got them the worst through the pandemic was the joe rogan thing mm-hmm. they blasted him for the horse steamer thing they changed the color of the image in my opinion that was maybe one of their worst moves to sort of move them move the needle the wrong way for them because like not for nothing rogan's got like like you said it's just People don't want to be deceived. They may not agree with Rogan. They might agree with CNN, but that went viral, viral when they're like, oh, because his, his audience is a hundred times bigger. So you do that. He's like, no, guys, here's the real photo. This is bunk. And everyone who listens to CNN goes, ah, fuck, that's, that's pretty egregious. That's pretty bad. And now you question everything they say. And I think that's where Canada is just with the mainstream media in general, you know? Yeah. What's, what's interesting with political discourse these days is that Let's say, okay, you're more sympathetic towards right-wing causes and you intake right-wing media. You are going to get exposed 
to both sides of every story because first you're searching out alternative media. Yes. Let's say, for instance, us. But the left-wing media and propaganda is getting shoved down your throat through every single mechanism in society. Like if you yeah, go, you can't avoid it. If you go to a restaurant, they've got CB twenty four on. Yeah, or whatever, you can't avoid right? it. You can't avoid it. Hundred percent. So you can't avoid it. So, but if so, if you're right wing, you're exposed to both sides yes. of their narrative. Yes. If you're left wing and you don't intake right wing alternative media, which you have to go search for, you have to go through the weeds and find it. You only get are exposed story. to left wing. So even if you know that that left wing state funded media is lying to you, you still don't have an alternative. So let's say what they tell you is 100% a lie. Well, then you might listen to them and go, well, okay, I feel like they're bullshitting me, but there's probably something here along the line, which is true. Yeah. Even if the whole entire thing is a lie, but they won't hear that alternative. So they still buy into that narrative at least somewhat. Well, that's why I always talk about Trudeau and how he frames his stories. He says things that are inflammatory and make no sense because then I always go to everybody, but that's the only story anybody over 50 is going to see. Oh, 60. You know what I mean? That's the only story the boomers are going to hear. That's the only story people deep into the left wing are going to hear. That's it. That's now the narrative. Even though it's completely untrue, that's now the only headline that matters to them. And that's how he, that's how he continues to win in, in the media space anyway. Yeah. And that's what CBC has been for this guy, right? So, you know, what I find somewhat um, admirable from Polyev is he could utilize these organizations for himself, his own gain, but he's just like, no, you got to go. You're too, you're wrought with corruption. This is total nonsense. You got to go. I don't even need it. Just get rid of it completely. I love that. I don't support many politicians, but uh, any, any politician who is willing to dismantle government power and actually give it away and say, no, we don't want this yeah. mechanism anymore. Uh, I'll at least give them a shot. Yeah, especially when it comes to media, because I say this all the time, the media is their most powerful weapon. Yeah, so for sure. All right, anything else you want to add today? That is everything. All right, don't forget to head over to our Substack where you can find original articles and exclusive podcast episodes as well as have a direct line to us. And, uh, you know, again, we are an independent media company and we hope to fight back more effectively against Trudeau and his socialist regime. But uh, again, that takes uh, some support. So if you're able to, that would be much appreciated. All right. We'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody.